Hello MMA fans and welcome to the debut episode of Sparring Sessions with John Franklin. On this video series I will invite some of the best journalists and pundits in MMA to spar with me over the issues of the day in the fight game. We start the debate with one of the best, Emma Challens is a colleague of mine at Combat Press and the driving force, owner and editor of Fight News Australia. Emma joins us to talk one of the biggest stars in the fight game globally, Conor McGregor. Emma, welcome and thanks very much for joining me. Thanks mate, thanks for having me. All right, Emma, I want to start the discussion, and I kind of went back and forth about how I want to do this. So let's sort of start talking about Connor. I, we'll do some timeline stuff, but I want to get, get your thoughts on him. So obviously this whole thing began because Connor was one of the biggest stars in the world. He had a fight book with lightweight champion Rafael Dos Anjos. RDA breaks his foot, which it's kind of funny to think, what if RDA would have never broke his foot? And uh, so Connor puts together a fight in the, with the UFC at 170 with Nate Diaz. The fight is short notice and up two weight classes. When you initially heard about the fight booking, what were your thoughts? Firstly, I was absolutely devastated that we weren't going to get this lightweight title fight, which I think would have been, you know, a huge step up in competition for Connor and Rafael. When I first heard that Nate got the gig, I wasn't really surprised. I knew that they needed to have someone that they could sell, that could sell the show on short notice and who's a better character than Nate Diaz. In terms of what I thought in terms of the fight, um, I thought that Connor would win, but I thought that Nate's jiu-jitsu was good enough to give him, you know, at least a bit of a battle. And I, like many other people, were very surprised at the outcome. So at this point, is it safe to say that you're still on Team Connor in the sense that you feel like he's making smart decisions? Or do you think that he should have... Were you... Glad that he took the fight in the sense that you thought he was going to win? And that it was good for I, his career? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it's great that he's willing to take chances and take risks. You know, that's it, it makes him such a compelling character and, a, and a, an amazing athlete, you know, that he wants to challenge himself. And I think everyone respects that. I think um, when he lost and he was humble about it, he won a lot of fans and he won a lot of respect. He definitely got mine, that's for sure. Obviously, I was a fan anyway, but I think following that, um, you got to see another side of him and it wasn't all this brass, shit-talking Irishman kind of thing. It was like, he's a real he's a real guy. He's a real feelings and, you know, he really cares about this sport and he loves it, so. I agree. I thought at that point that, that was kind of where he himself could sort of push back a little bit against this thing where all the people that are heavily promoted have to be undefeated and sort of invincible. I thought that he had an opportunity to sort of change that narrative. So, like you said, he gets choked out by Nate and all his plans, which may or may not have included Robbie Lawler or George St. Pierre, sort of go out the window. Then Connor goes about the business, I believe, of just trying to erase the loss altogether by stating he wants a rematch with Diaz, again at 170, which people are questioning, at UFC 200. So, when he lost, what were your thoughts on him sort of being this, so obsessed with getting the rematch at 170 and, and being sort of having tunnel vision on it? I think it was really interesting because when we think back to the, the post-fight interview, he was almost adamant that he was going to go and defend his title, like the featherweight title. He was going to go back to that, which I feel he should have done. Okay, yeah, you've got... Frankie Edgar is sitting on the sidelines, the perennial bridesmaid. Um, it doesn't surprise me that Connor then turned around and had tunnel vision on Nate Diaz. No, he's he's that guy. He's like the LeBron James of MMA. Like once he gets something in his mind, he's going to do it. Like there's no stopping him. Um, I had absolutely zero interest in seeing a rematch. It wasn't competitive, and while I can you know, understand where Connor was coming from in terms of gassing out and not knowing what it was like to fight a guy of that size and not having that reach advantage and all that kind of jazz. Nobody wanted to see that fight. I'm sorry, only the casual fan who watches one pay-per-view a year wanted to see that fight. Uh, and this is where I think we start to disconnect and this is where we can start to maybe raise our gloves a little bit. I think that for Connor's purposes... Um, he can only worry about the fans so much, and I think that the fan that watches the fight once a year is the fan that Connor's going after, and I think that that's the fan mm -hmm. the UFC's going after because you and I we're gonna we're gonna watch everything because you know that's just who we are. So I, I think that this is when Connor starts to a little bit because he had to get the belt to 
have that bargaining chip so that no matter what happens, and we'll get to that here in a second, no matter what happens, he always has that featherweight belt to sort of say, well, I'm relevant because, you know, Frankie Edgar has to fight me or Jose Aldo has to fight me for this belt. So I think this is where he's sort of, sort of saying that, you know, there's, there's bigger things than this 145-pound belt. I got it so that I have a, a bargaining chip. And we start to see Conor the negotiator come out. Do you, do, are you with me there so far? Mm. 100%. I, I totally agree with you. It, the fact that, like, you know, people always say to me, oh, but he got beaten. But it's like he's still the champ. He still has the belt. Don't forget this. So, yes, he does definitely has, still have a bargaining chip there. Okay, next thing we knew, Emma, uh, Conor comes out and, and uh, stuns the MMA world by announcing his retirement via social media. Does it take long for us to find out that he's at odds with the UFC over the amount of promotion he has to do? Throughout all this... McGregor claims he does his fair share of promoting, which he probably does more than his fair share of promoting, if we're being honest, while the UFC counters that it wasn't enough. What was your take on the, on the retirement play? And I guess my larger question is, do you think there should be a different set of rules for Conor McGregor? There absolutely should not be. I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking with a business hat on here, like from the UFC's perspective, there absolutely shouldn't be a separate set of rules. You start making a very dangerous precedence and you start losing a little bit of control. Um, the whole retirement thing was just hilarious, but it proved what a huge star he is, not just in this sport, but like transcending the sport as well, um, which again gives him a huge amount of leverage. But at the end of the day, this is the fight game. You're only as good as what you promote. Like there's plenty of athletes out there who can win and are phenomenal fighters, but they don't have the gift of the gab like Conor McGregor does. And yeah, I mean, to his it, like, don't get me wrong. The guy promotes the hell out of fights, and he's done his fair share. But it's still a part of his contract, and I think it was ridiculous for him to to not partake in you know, some promotions and maybe it is above and above beyond, but there's plenty of other guys out there who would like kill for this kind of opportunity and the money that comes along with it. Cause let's face it, Conor McGregor may be earning 10 mil a fight or whatever he does now, but he only does that because the UFC has given him the platform to do so. Don't bite the hand that feeds you. It's like, I can't remember who said it, but it's like a millionaire getting in a pissing contest with a billionaire. You're just going to get squashed. And I've said it before, and I'll say it a thousand times, even though I'm a McGregor fan, there will always be a guy that can shit talk and fight well. He's not Ronda Rousey. I, well, you know what? I, I agree and I disagree. I, I feel like in your uh, – and, and this is why I was so fascinated to have you on and talk to you about this, because there's such a fine line in this. And I think that I, – I, like I said, I agree and I disagree with you. I do agree – that he is on some level uh, was a, a created by the UFC, so he does owe them something. Now, I think that when you say that all these guys are showing up to these press conferences and stuff like that, Connor, if we're, if we're going to start making a pile of all the promotion that we've generated, Connor's pile is already way huger than REA's and already way huger, huger than even uh, Nate Diaz's. So I do think to a certain extent uh, it is dangerous for the UFC to have a separate set of rules for Conor McGregor. But we've seen ever since he announced his retirement that he is able to promote himself without sort of going to do these press conferences, going to do these commercials. And it's like I said, it's a fine line. So I do think personally there should be a different set of rules for Conor McGregor. And I do think that you have to go about figuring out a way. There's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes, Emma, that we uh, as journalists fight very hard to find out about. And the UFC tries very hard to suppress. I think this should be one of those things where they just sort of say, ah, Connor's got a thing or Connor's got this. And, you know, they figure out a way to sort of let the media and the public think that Connor is right and not being somewhere when realistically he's just not wanting to do press. And I, and I completely understand where you're coming from. I just think that you have to respect how much promotion he generates not doing it in the way that they want him to. Connor McGregor sends a tweet and it already accomplishes more than Cain Velasquez showing up to 20 press conferences. Yeah, but you also have to remember that not everyone is on social media. I know that's hard to believe, but there's probably a lot of fight fans out there who are waiting to see press conferences, who do want to see the promo clip. This isn't just about the press conference, remember. The USC was investing millions of dollars into promotional um, material in terms of advertisements, photography, videos, the whole shebang that they were going to use in the lead up to this fight. And then not to mention the fact that Sorry. Um, I totally lost my train of thought then. 
Not to mention the fact that this fight, this three months out from the fight. Well, I understand where the guy's coming from. He wants to focus on his training, but you're never going to get away from promoting. Promoting goes hand in hand with fighting. It has since the freaking dawn of time. And yes, he may do more than others, but he also gets paid a shit ton more than others. So He does. And I guess another point of disconnection maybe, and, and let me ask you this. Do you think that, the, that there is a possibility, and this a strong possibility, that maybe the UFC and Conor McGregor in certain areas just have different... Um, have to have different agendas. Like, if Conor McGregor loses fights, nobody wants him to promote anything. So does he have to kind of buy, look out for himself? Or do you think, okay, just fall in line? And I mean, is it possible that they could both be right? I think I can understand where both of them are coming from, honestly. And Conor does need to look after himself because as an athlete, there's only a short window of opportunity to make money for the rest of your life. So I can totally understand if this was, like, about a monetary thing. Um... But for it to be about press or allegedly just to be about the press commitments, I think it's just a little bit ridiculous. And I think, honestly, like, it wasn't even so much that he didn't want to do it. It was all the shit that happened after it, like, just acting like a spoiled brat. on so. And, this, and I have to keep reiterating the fact that I'm a huge Conor McGregor fan. I love the guy. But everything that has followed on social media has made me just go, I'm so freaking sick of this guy. Like, just shut this guy up. And you know what, I think that's, that was the most important reason for me to want to talk to you about it, because from your perspective of being a McGregor fan, you know, and to also be sort of at your wit's end with him is what makes this fascinating. So the next sort of uh, play in the timeline, or the next moment in the timeline, the UFC smartly used Conor McGregor's uh, retirement against him and threatened that if he retired, he would obviously have USADA issues. The smart play, I thought, was them saying that they would make the Aldo Edgar fight for the real belt, not the interim belt, so that now Conor loses that 145 title bargaining chip. Um, at this point, Connor's off UFC 200, going back and forth with the UFC in the media. I mean, you're, at this point, you got to be completely checked out on Connor's plan, Emma. Is that correct? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, there is there can be a, such thing as overexposure. I mean, we all saw it with Ronda. Um, but yeah, I just yeah, it's just boring to me now. The whole thing. It's just like we want to see you fight, man. <laughs> like, and even Connor said in his Sports Center interview that, you know, I don't know if he necessarily regrets it, but he has definitely thought at times why I should have just got on that bloody plane. Do you know what I mean? Like this whole thing has been blown out of proportion over something completely ridiculous. Yeah, I think that you're you're right in the sense that they they have a lot of money they can make with each other. I I always thought, and I want to get your thought on this. I always thought that once the UFC had a reason to take Conor off UFC 200, they realized that wow, we have a unique opportunity here because if we can already make UFC 200 money by virtue of the fact that it's UFC 200, and we can get Conor on 201 or 202, the cumulative money we're going to make from UFC 200 and whatever card Conor's on is going to be more than if it would have been if he'd have been on 200 and that card just would have had anybody. So do you think that maybe the UFC's like, ah, this is kind of a, you know, it sucks the way it went down, but we kind of benefit from this because he's now going to bolster whatever card he's on next. Yeah, totally. I don't think the UFC gives a crap, really. Um, that card was going to be re so good anyway. And like you said, they were always going to make money down the line with Connor on another card. Um, and even more so now, probably because there's been so much interest generated over the last kind of like four to six weeks um, and people want to know what, what's going to happen next. Like, is he going to fight Nate Diaz? Is he going to fight for the featherweight title? Is he going to fight Mayweather? Like, what's happening? Um, I also, in the back of my mind, after they released the McGregor-Diaz rematch, there was so much backlash on social media that I think they almost breathed a sigh of relief that this fight got canned. I agree. And you know what, Emma, you're such a pro. You set me up perfectly for the next thing, which is the fight with Floyd Mayweather. <laughs> it seems like everything else is sort of out the window. So the Floyd Mayweather rumors begin. Connor and Floyd have both now um, sort of confirmed that it was Floyd that started it, which is big, which is really a big st – the one thing that doesn't get talked about that much is how big a step for MMA it is that Floyd Mayweather feels that the UFC and MMA is relevant enough to use it to promote himself. That's mm. something that no one's talking about, but it's interesting. Now, the absolute latest on this is I've heard two things. I've heard one, Colin Cowherd of Fox Sports has said he believes the fight's going down September of this year. He's already booked his room. Jalen Rose, who is the one who broke 
Floyd Mayweather versus Manny Pacquiao said next May 2017, which makes a lot of sense for me because Floyd's trying to take juice away from Canelo Alvarez and Triple G potentially. He's thinking the fight's going to be then. So at this point, do you think that um, obviously it makes sense for Conor to promote uh, a fight with Floyd just to, to raise his own profile? What are your thoughts on a fight between Conor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather? This is not going to end well for McGregor. If this is a pure boxing match, I'm sorry. You can't take the greatest of all time against a guy who's a mixed martial artist. And that's not to take anything away from Conor striking. He's a great boxer. But if Manny Pacquiao can barely put a glove on Mayweather, McGregor's not going to touch him. It's just going to be embarrassing. The whole thing is embarrassing, to be honest. But huge payday for McGregor. He could essentially retire after this if the UFC allowed him to take the fight because as we know he's under contract to the UFC so he actually can't take the fight even if he wants to unless he wants a massive legal battle on his hands but if I was Dana White and Lorenzo I'd be like pushing this bad boy because it's just more promotion for the UFC at the end of the day and I guess that's a perfect thing that I was going to talk about next is that when you talk about a fight with Floyd Mayweather if you're the UFC do you kind of want to say you know what dude if you want to go fight Floyd Mayweather go ahead because it, it I, I'm so confused by this, Emma, and this is why. Because let's say, let's say Floyd gives him $50 million to fight him, all right? And the UFC says, you know what, Connor? Your uh, get-out-of-contract fee is 25 So you take half, we'll take half. You're still making more than you have made. We'll take our $25 million and probably be able to pay off the next three cards as far as salaries go. So, so that's fine. But if you're the UFC, d- does it make more sense? Do you kind of want Connor to get humbled? Because on the one hand, he's getting humbled, but on the other hand, he has enough money to be a more powerful negotiator. So if you're the UFC, what, what do you really want here? I mean, that's what that's the most confusing part. If you're the UFC, you want Connor to win, that's the end of discussion right there. If, if Connor loses to Mayweather on, a, on such a huge platform, remember you're bringing eyeballs from so many different sports, lots of casual sports fans now. This is not just MMA fans and, you know, casual McGregor fans. This is everyone. Everyone's tuning in for this fight. It's going to do ridiculous numbers. If Connor gets beaten... How does he come back from that? That's Seriously, good, how does he come back from well, that? Well, here's how I think he comes back from it, and that's an interesting question. I think that everything that Connor does that's not fighting at 145 pounds raises his profile and always gives him that sort of get-out-of-jail-free card to say, well, you know, I'm the 145-pound champ, and I was fighting 170s. Or for him to say, I am an MMA champ, and I was boxing. He always has this thing, where, and I think that's part of why he's doing all this stuff outside of there may be a little Anderson Silva knocking out Forrest Griffin to it as well, but there's this whole thing of like, I'm the champ at 145 pounds, and everything else I do, I can always say, well, I was out of my comfort zone. So do you think that that's the case, or do you think that the more he loses, even out of 145 pounds, it starts to take a little bit of shine off Connor? It absolutely takes a little bit of shine off him. I mean, when he lost the one at 170 against Nate, it didn't phase me because it was a risk. It was going into uncharted territory, and like you said, he still had the belt. But if he keeps chasing these these challenges, and whilst I like respect it from an athletic perspective, um, people don't like losers. Sorry. You know, <laughs> hello. Do you think people <laughs> still loved Mike Tyson when he was getting his ass handed to him? No, they love Mike Tyson who knocked out a guy with one punch. People want to see people win. They want to see it done beautifully. That's what Conor McGregor is known for. That's why we love him. I, I don't want to see Conor McGregor losing, and he will, he will get his ass kicked by Mayweather. There's no question. And I, I, well, I agree, and this is a, sort of a, a, a further explanation of that, is that he starts to move into Chael Sonnen territory, doesn't he? With all due respect to Chael Sonnen, is once you lose and once you don't win that belt you know it was fine when you went four and a half rounds with anderson silva and then got triangle because everybody's like well you know you kicked your, you kicked his ass four and a half rounds even anderson would concede that but in the second fight when you get you know wiped out two rounds it's a little bit hard to keep playing the i'm the uncrowned champion game so uh, once yeah. connor starts to you know Con- that was the difference all along between connor and shale was that they both sort of talked all this shit and connor was the one that really backed it up Chael backed it up a little bit, but Connor was the one that, you know, was was complete hell for Jose Aldo and then flattened him in 13 seconds and said, well, I told you this guy was garbage, and I just showed it to you. And like you said, if he starts to do all this stuff where it's like, you know, Mayweather needs to come to me, I'm the one that's in control here, it seems like he's 
getting in pissing contests with guys, like you said, who we can't really win them with. So it's it's weird. It's, it's kind of a weird situation. So at, at this point, um, let's talk about just sort of where this leaves us, and then we'll, we'll get out of here on this. All this stuff, whether we agree with it or we disagree with it, we can agree that from the perspective that it's raised Connor's profile throughout. So do you think that moving forward – he needs to just sort of uh, play ball and focus on things, or is this wild card stuff kind of working for him? I think the wild card thing is working for him in that it makes him interesting to not just MMA fans, but just sports fans generally because he's such an interesting character. But I think he can only play it so far. At the end of the day, I know we said this before, we don't have to talk about us. We'll, we will watch whatever, but... I just want to see him go back to 145, maybe dabble at 155. You know, that's just pretty close to his normal walking around weight. Um, and get, just get and just do what he has to do um, and be the champ and defend his belt. I just, yeah, I'm sick of the game playing and, the, and it's a bit, become a circus. And to be honest, he almost seems a little bit like delusional um, on social media right now. Like, yeah, I just can't handle it. I'm over it. Just, I just want to see him fight again. If he wins, I'm sure, you know, we'll all be back on the McGregor train once again. <laughs> I agree, and I think as much as we've, we've sort of disagreed at moments in this, I think the, the real thing, uh, I think I kind of echo your sentiment in that you look at a guy like Connor and just say, just come to your full potential. And your full potential mm -hmm. is not in the boxing ring with Floyd Mayweather. It's not really at 170 pounds against Nate Diaz. You know, fight Frank Yeager, fight Rafael Dos Anjos. Let's see what you can really do against the guys you should be fighting. There's weight classes for a reason. Well, let's not yeah, hop exactly. up and sort of screw around and do all this. All right, guys. He hasn't even defended his belt one time. <laughs> <laughs> That's the genius of the guy, Emma. He has not defended his belt even one time, and I can't go to ESPN.com. I don't have to go to ESPN.com MMA, mind you. If I go to ESPN.com and scroll for about four seconds, I see Conor McGregor. And that's sort of the genius of him. What can he get, you know, it's like one of those things, what can I get accomplished without actually doing my job here, which is defending my own belt. So it's, it's really fascinating. We've never seen anybody like Connor, uh, Rhonda included. Rhonda is a celebrity. The thing that I said, and this is not to, to sort of kick Rhonda when she's down. I want to talk about, about her just for a second. But the, I think the difference between the two is that um, Connor is more, um, Connor's done all this in the MMA world, really. Like, Rhonda has things outside of MMA that sort of drew attention to her. You know, she's a beautiful woman. She's uh, in movies. She has sort of the, you know, do-nothing bitch movement and getting name-dropped by Beyonce at concerts. Like, she was a cultural icon. Conor McGregor's kind of a fight icon. That's the thing that I think is the most fascinating thing about it. Yeah, I, I agree to a point. I think, like, when we look back, you know, 50 years from now, we look at MMA... When I think about people who change the game, I, I guess because I'm a woman, I relate more to Rhonda because she basically, well, for certain, she didn't just put MMA on the map for women. She put it on the map, you know, taking it out into the general public and and becoming this, like you said, cultural icon. Um, Connor's done the same in that he's just broken every rule in the book and is doing it his way. If I could compare the two, I would say Connor's like the self-serving guy and Rhonda's the company man. Do you know what I mean? No, I agree. She, I, will, she will just do whatever. Yeah, no, I think that, that there is no Connor without Rhonda. I think that everything that Connor accomplished. Heck no. Well, what I mean by that is mainstream media always sort of used Connor. At, at the beginning, when we first started talking about Connor, it was Rhonda and Connor. And then as things progressed, Connor sort of, you know, when she started, he, he attached himself to someone else in Floyd Mayweather, but it was always. Connor was always viewed through the through the lens of Rhonda initially, so yeah, she's. She and let's think about it though. Think about it. Floyd Mayweather and the whole MMA game only came into it because of Rhonda, not because of Connor. Remember? Yeah, her, yeah, absolutely. Her calling out Floyd and her sort of, you know, taking shots. Connor's at basically ridden Rhonda's coattails. <laughs> How did I know that you were going to figure out a way to make to, to put Rhonda up over Connor? And you did it beautifully. So how Thank I can't you. even argue with it. But no, I think that we're at the point now where it's a little, because of what happened in the home fight, and it's not to get off on the Rhonda thing, but I, I do agree with you. I think because of what happened in the home fight, 
everybody started to forget what it's kind of like what happened with the Buster Douglas and Mike Tyson. You forget what the person was because of the last lasting memory. So I'll get you out of here on this on a separate topic. What, what do you think the future holds for Ronda? I have to ask you. I'd be remiss if I didn't. Do you know what's funny? I actually have played this out in my head so many times. When she lost against, against home, my immediate thought was home tape, right? Then I was like, Misha will beat Holly. I picked that already. Then I wanted the re- uh, then I wanted um, Ronda to fight Misha, get the belt back, then do the rematch against Holly with the belt, but win this time. That would have been like the ultimate. Obviously, that's not going to happen because Misha's fighting Amanda Nunes. But I do think that Ronda will fight for the belt in New York. She's been a massive advocate for legalizing MMA in New York. And I think she will headline that card. And she deserves to. I agree. There's nothing I want more. And I don't think Ronda's ready to play ball with this um, because she has other interests in life. You know, she has a relationship with Travis Brown and wherever that's going to go. Um, she has movie. She has other options besides fighting. But Emma, I so desperately want Ronda Rousey, Holly Holm, Misha Tate, and Kat Zingano to be Roberto Duran, Sugar Ray Leonard, Thomas Hearns, and Marvin Hagler. My, what that would do for women's MMA and MMA at large? They've all got victories over each other. They've all got their, sort of this interwoving of, and I just wish they were all on board and willing to fight each other. And oh God, <laughs> would that be amazing! Just f- keep fighting epic. each other. Three fights <laughs> against each other forever. It would be great. All right, guys. Yep. There you have it. The great Emma Challenge from uh, Combat Press and Fight News Australia. Uh, I think that if we went to the judges, it would be 30-27 Challenge on this one without a doubt. <laughs> so um, I appreciate your time very much. I hope to do this more in the future. And uh, thanks for coming on. No worries. Thanks, mate. Absolutely. Cheers.